Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. We hope you're healthy and staying happy and calm during these unsettling times. We're so thrilled you could join us for today's webinar, Growing Up in Porn Culture, The Social, Emotional, and Cognitive Impact on Youth with Dr. Gail Dines, co-founder founder, and president of Culture Reframed. We have over 1,200 participants today, and I am thrilled because I truly believe that every parent, every educator, anybody who knows children, works with children, should see this critical webinar, especially now when our children's and our lives are completely virtual and access to technology is within everybody's reach. Um, this webinar is the seventh uh, webinar of the World Without Exploitation speaker series, Now and Next, Today's Issues, Tomorrow's Solutions. We are so grateful to our speaker series sponsor, Demand Abolition, which combats the demand for commercial sex in the United States, and is spearheaded by Ambassador Swanee Hunt, a fierce and unwavering advocate herself and supporter of the abolitionist movement for several decades. My name is Lynna Nealon. I'm a founding co-chair of World Without Exploitation and the former founding director of Demand Abolition. Most recently, I've been working with the World Without Exploitation team organizing our yearly conferences. We were so excited, expecting more than 300 people this May to come together and learn about our most critical issues and how to stop exploitation and of course, how to postpone. And that's why the speaker series was born, because we saw that people still wanted to connect and that it was more critical than ever that we explore this ever-shifting landscape and how we can stop the growing exploitation among the most vulnerable. And we're, again, very thankful to Demand Abolition that is allowing us to offer these webinars for free. We do ask that those who can donate to our Act Now Fund. The Act Now Fund is supporting survivors and survivor-led organizations who are on the front lines, working with the most vulnerable among us and helping them get through this crisis. A few logistics. This is Zoom webinar, not Zoom meeting, so the controls will look a little bit different. You should see the speaker in the presentation at all times, so if you don't, um, please chat me and I'll, I'll see what I can do to help. Um, we will, the presentation will be about 40 minutes. We will have 15, 15 or so minutes um, for Q&A at the end. Please use the Q&A icon on the bottom of your screen to send questions. This is a graphic presentation. I can't stress that enough. I have four young children and they're constantly coming in and out. Um, so please do know this is, there are graphic images. Um, so make sure you don't have young ones wandering in and out. Um, feel free to share and post on social media to get the word out. We will be sharing this video afterwards on our website and you'll receive an email tomorrow with more information about where you can find that. So now I would like to turn it over to the National Director of World Without Exploitation to say a little bit more about our coalition and introduce our incredible speaker. Thanks so much, Lena. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm seeing in the chat, um, people have joined us from all over the world and that is so incredibly exciting for us. We at this critical moment at World Without Exploitation have been so inspired to watch week after week our numbers growing and people coming together in community to learn together. I want you to learn about World Without Exploitation, but I recognize in this moment that time is precious, especially with this incredible speaker. So I'm gonna move right ahead to introducing Gail Dines. Before I do, I also want to thank um, Swanee Hunt and Demand Abolition so much for sponsoring this series. We are immensely grateful for your partnership, for your wisdom, and for your support. And now to Gail. So Dr. Gail Dines is the founder and president of Culture Reframed and Professor Emerita of Sociology and Women's Studies. Having researched and written about the porn industry for more than 30 years, Dr. Dines is internationally claimed as the leading expert on how pornography shapes our identities, culture, and sexuality. 
Dr. Dines is the co-editor of the best-selling best textbook, Gender, Race, and Class in Media. Her book, Pornland, is literally a Bible. Um, Pornland, How Porn Has Hijacked Our Sexuality. That has been translated into five languages and adapted into a documentary film, and it is seriously a must read. Um, Dr. Dines also has a TEDx talk on YouTube, which is a must watch. Um, and with that, Gail, thank you so much for joining us. We're so excited to have you and we can't wait to learn from you. Hi, can you see me? Yes, you're perfect. Great. I, I'll stay on until your screen is shared and then I will hop right off. Okay, you're in good shape. Okay, so what I wanna talk about is really what's going on in the world of young people and what it means to grow up in a porn culture and a hypersexualized culture. And we actually at Culture Reframe call this the public health crisis of the digital age. Now the problem with this is it is a stealth public health crisis. It's stealth because many parents, educators, experts in the field don't actually know what's going on and the shifts and changes with pornography. And I've spoken to many major organizations who really should know what's going on because they've been tasked with taking care of kids. So who really do know is um, the media. And I want to give you an example from details, which is kind of cosmopolitan for boys. For, and what, they had an article called How Internet Porn is Changing Teen Sex. And they interviewed Joanna Angel, who is a pornographer. And she said, the girls these days, they just seem to come to the set porn ready. Now, that's a really important concept. And the question is, what does it mean? And I'm gonna argue that we're not talking about just women who end up in the sex industry, but that actually we're talking about a mass socialization of all of our girls being porn ready, whether they ever end up on a porn set or not. And how do they get to be porn ready? Well, to understand this, we have to think about what it means to live in a porn culture and the images. And the fact is now that this generation today was brought up where the image, not the printed word, is the major form of communication. And as Neil Postman once said, we developed some immunization to the seduction of eloquence of the printed word. We have not developed any immunization to the seduction of eloquence of the image. And if we go through the main images we see that young women and men, but mainly young women are just thrown at, we see this constant bombarding of hypersexualized imagery. Example, the Kardashians. And I think it's really important to be aware that the Kardashians is not so much a family as an international corporation with a brand that is beyond most brands in terms of its ability to harness capital and to be well known across all platforms, including Snapchat and Instagram. And especially the younger one, Kylie Jenner, who's on Snapchat all the time with selfies, which I'm going to address a bit later. So again, when we think about the images that bombard us and the way that women's bodies are always shown, cut up into bits and pieces, and really think about this for a moment. How many women out there listening right now do this to yourselves? Where you look in the mirror and you cut yourself up into bits and pieces. This bit needs work, this bit needs work, every bit needs work, everything needs help. And of course, in order to do that, you have to spend money. So it's really important to think about this women's self-loathing and girls' self-loathing as a way to increase profits and the ways in which often it's women of color and women from the developing world and making products for more privileged women, clothes, makeup, hair, hair products, etc. And in fact, much of global capitalism depends on the exploitation of this female labor, but we never really talk about that. And we never really discuss the ways in which these young girls have to develop a sense of self surrounded by these images that again are just throwing them images that are impossible to compete with. Now it is mainly a white world. It's actually starkly white. We do let some women of color in, especially for like Beyonce or Rihanna, but overall what we're talking about is a world where the beauty standard is white, thin, young, and impossible to live up to. And even the women in the images don't look 
like this. These are super airbrushed images, they're technologically enhanced. And I want to just talk about, for example, um, how this image works. So let's do some stuff around visual grammar here. And look at who she's speaking to, because there's this concept in media theory called the reader inscribed in the text. And I want you to look at her and ask who is she talking to? And ask yourself, is she speaking to her mother saying, let's go for a cup of coffee after the photo shoot? Highly unlikely. Who she's speaking to is men. And that look and that pose is what we call the fuck me look. And what's interesting is the fuck me look for women is one of vulnerability. Come and get me. It generally doesn't work for men. The, the pose that works for men that we see all over the media is not so much fuck me, come and get me. It's more like a fuck you pose. So what we see here is we are setting up in our gender system a class called men who are seen as sexual aggressors and a class of women who are seen as sexually submissive. This is why it's really important to think of violence against women, especially rape, as not a form of deviance, but actually as a normalized part of a culture, especially a porn culture. And that's why many of us argue that men who rape are not actually sexually deviants, they're over conformist to the messages of our culture. So the girls really have, the young girls have a choice. They can either conform to pop culture or they can become invisible. So either visibility, invisibility or fuckability. Those are your choices. And I can't begin to tell you how many times I actually speak at colleges or high schools where young girls or women come up to me and they say, you know what? I chose invisibility because I can't do fuckability, but I'm alone. I don't have any friends. I don't go out. Or on the other side, girls who come up to me and say, I chose fuckability, but I don't like it. It's not really a choice. I had nothing else. I didn't want to be alone. So when you give them a kind of choice between conformity or invisibility, it's not really a choice because what the real choice is, is a whole cornucopia of choices that make sense to who you want to be as you grow up and develop a sexual identity, develop a sense of self, then become the author of your own lives. Now, what impact does all of this have on girls and on men? And when I was writing Pornland, I could sense that something had shifted in our culture. And especially as I was teaching women's study courses, I could feel a change in the young women in the classes. And when I was thinking this out, it was actually not a PhD in media studies or women's studies who made it clear. It was a incarcerated child molester. And what he said is very interesting. He was talking about how he groomed his 10 year old stepdaughter and he raped. And he said, the culture did a lot of the grooming for me. And that was like light bulbs going off in my head. The culture did a lot of the grooming for him. That means she was groomed by the culture getting for him. And then let's go back to what Joanna Angel said is how the girls come to the set porn ready. And then we see the way in which this is a collective grooming process by our culture to get our girls to see themselves as hypersexualized, as porn ready, and as fuckable. It used to be you needed an individual groomer to groom an individual girl. You still have that, but now we have a more economical way. And the more economical way is this collective grooming. So I want to talk now also about the impact of the digital culture on teens, because we can't really discuss any of this without understanding the changes that have happened with the cell phone. Now, most kids, especially in the United States, end up getting the cell phone around middle school. And this is when the trouble often starts. This is when the fights begin at home. But middle school is really when the cell phone, if not before, begins to enter into the landscape of the home and into the landscape of youth culture. And there was, I want to talk a little bit about the platforms that are specifically geared to um, teens. So we know Instagram, Snapchat, and now increasingly TikTok has become a major teen platform where kids try to share lip syncing images of themselves, often hypersexualized. And we also know that on TikTok, there is a real problem with groomers and perpetrators 
and predators searching out and contacting girls from TikTok. If we look at Instagram, again, the numbers are unbelievable. And it is impossible to monitor this type of content with this many active users. So as much as these platforms argue that they monitor content, the truth is they don't. And what is the main image on Instagram? It's of course the selfie. Here's an example of Kylie Jenner with a selfie. And I just want to ask people a question. Do you remember when we used to take pictures of other people and not ourselves? Do you ever think how strange this is? constantly looking at oneself, perfecting the selfie, because by the way, there's never a good enough image and never good enough selfie. My students told me that they take selfie after selfie after selfie. So there's a kind of culture of, visit, of, self, of narcissism going on, of bodily narcissism, which as we'll find from the studies, is not healthy. Now, just to give you an example of how much selfie culture is part of youth culture, 74% of Snapchat photos are selfies, 93 million selfies taken each day, 19 out of 20 teens have taken a selfie, and a lot of the time these selfies are hypersexualized. What are the effects of this? Well, the APA report, American Psychological Association report on hypersexualized culture, found that Self, girls tend to learn to self-objectify through living in a pornified, hypersexualized culture. And the effects of self-objectification are anxiety, depression, body loathing, risky sexual behavior, self-harming, etc. So this has a really negative impact on the sexual, cognitive and emotional development of our girls. Also, in a recent study by the Royal Society for Public Health, they found that Instagram was deemed the worst app for mental health and well-being because that led to, as I, they said, increased anxiety, depression, bullying, and FOMO, fear of missing out. There's no going home. There's no closing the door and saying, I'm done for the day. I'm away from the mean girl syndrome. Or I've just got some time alone. When you have this to your ear or you're constantly looking, you're constantly on, and there's no respite from being part of this porn culture. Now, I also want to talk about perp culture part two, because I really believe that the porn culture is perpetrating against our boys as well. And to begin to understand that, let's get into, again, Details Magazine, the same story, where they wrote, there's an entire generation of young people who think sex ends with a money shot to the face. For those who don't know, a money shot is ejaculation on the face. And the reason they're saying this is virtually all porn movies today, almost impossible to find one that doesn't, ends with the man or men ejaculating onto the face or into the eyes of women. And when the studies and they ask young men, what is the one sex act you really like to perform? What often comes up is, I wanna come on her face. And I know when I was growing up, if some guy would have said, can I come on your face, you would have run a mile. What are you talking about? What is this? So this is the way in which, again, porn culture has shifted what is normalized sexual behavior. Now, on top of this, we have a, what we call a parental naivete gap. And what that means is that most parents really underestimate how much porn their kids see. They also don't know what porn is. And many will say, not my kid. He or she, but mainly he doesn't look at porn. So you have a kind of perfect storm of, you know, cell phones, a porn culture, and parents who really are kind of at a loss. And this isn't to blame parents, because parenting, I know as a parent, is one of the most humbling, difficult jobs you'll ever do. But we do need parents and people who are charged with taking care of kids to not have this naivete gap and to understand what is going on and the impact. So again, let's look at the secret digital life of kids. And one of the things that's been found is that on Instagram, a lot of the porn is hidden behind emojis. So what might look innocent on your kid's Instagram account actually is porn. This is, stands in for penises, this can stand in for testicles, breasts, oral sex, no prizes for guessing what that is, and anything with teardrops stands in for ejaculation. There's a whole secret life out there with how kids speak to each other, how they look for porn on um, uh, social media, and how they text each other. 
Now I went onto Instagram and I just looked around to see what images girls and young women were posting and I came up with these within two minutes. So really what the, a lot of the young women are doing is they're copying the pornified way of being. They're using that as the template for what it means to be visible in a pornified culture. Also, the porn industry, always eager to come in and get new platforms, take over, colonize new platforms, especially teen platforms, has gotten onto um, Instagram. And porn performers such as Sonny Leone has an actual following of over 11.7 million. So this is a way in which you build up your following on Instagram and then you direct them to your porn videos, often on Pornhub, which I'll be talking about a bit later. Also what I want to talk about is Snapchat and especially Snapchat Premium, because this is where the porn is in Snapchat Premium. Behind all your Snap <coughs> Snapchat Premium, which can be around $15 a month, is where you see the hardcore porn. And now the porn industry actually has six different or seven different corporations that will set up a Snapchat premium site for porn performers where you can go straight from here to uh, hardcore porn. And they promise these companies that they'll set it up from soup to nuts. And if Snapchat finds it and takes it down because it's too explicit, they'll have you up and running within 24 hours so that you don't lose any revenue or any fan base. So I would argue that Instagram, Snapchat, and other apps are real gateways to the porn industry by normalizing porn. They're a way to get to kids early through the platforms that the kids are on. And just some statistics, they say the average age of viewing porn is 11. It's very hard to pin down. I've heard many people argue now that it's as young as eight and nine. And no matter what methodology you use, you're looking at about a third of the internet is pornography, whether it's traffic, downloading, whatever, or searches. What we do know is that porn sites get more visitors each month than Netflix, Amazon, and Twitter combined. And what's interesting when you read the porn press is they talk about the fact that this is an industry. This is not just a collection of images. This is an industry and we have to understand it as an industry and a predatory industry. And as they say, it's just as sophisticated and multi-layered as any other marketplace. They're like any other Fortune 500 company. And like all companies, what they do is they raise capital, they undergo mergers and acquisitions, they organize trade shows, they have PR firms, and most importantly, they interface with banks, credit card companies, venture capitalists, cable operators, etc. Now, what does that mean? That means that much of global capital has a vested interest in the continuation and growth of the porn industry. And many people say, well, if you did something about porn, it would go underground. Well, this is what happens when an industry comes above ground. It actually gets knitted into global capital, which makes it much harder to regulate and makes it much harder to control. Now, if you want to talk about the industry, we have to, of course, talk about MindGeek, which is the Amazon of porn. MindGeek owns most of the free porn sites, especially Pornhub. Now, Pornhub is the site that gets the most traffic. And the, here's the latest statistics, 42 billion visits last year, up from 33 billion in 2018. That's a daily average of 100 million visitors. It's actually gone up since the pandemic. The reason being that Pornhub made its premium sites free across the world. And you saw a jump all over the world. So then you have women actually isolating in home with, with men who are increasingly using pornography. Think of the impact of that. And what they like to boast is that 100 million daily visits is if the combined populations of Canada, Poland, Netherlands, and Australia visited Pornhub every day. So just get your head around what it means to get into a free porn sites and to see hardcore porn just a click away, a long way away from when Playboy, Penthouse and Hustler were the main three um, 
magazines a long way away from when you had to get up out of town and go to a pawn shop. Today, it's affordable, anonymous and accessible, the three A's that drive demand. And who does the porn industry have in the crosshairs of their rifle? They have, of course, the 11 year old boy. The target is on his back. And to understand this, you have to understand really the developing brain. Now, kids around pre-puberty and puberty, um, it's normal to be sexually interested, to be thinking about yourself as a sexual being. That's perfectly normal part of sexual development. What, we, what is not normal is that you have a global industry that is hijacking that sexual development. And what we know with kids, especially around um, the preteen brain and the teen brain, is that the prefrontal cortex is not fully developed which means they're seeking out novelty. It means they're making choices that we often say, oh, why did they do that? Well, it makes perfect sense when you look at the prefrontal cortex. And you know what? Again, that's perfectly normal as it should be. But when you put that in a porn culture, when you put that in a culture where Pornhub and hardcore porn is just a few seconds away, you can see once more perfect storm of boys, especially going to porn. So what do they see? Well, the gold standard study is that over 90% of the most viewed scenes have violence against women in them, some form of violence. And when you look at the content of mainstream porn, especially on Pornhub, you see that most of these scenes have either gagging and or rough anal sex, and I mean really rough, where they're really pounding away at the woman. And in fact, one of the problems with women in the porn industry is they constantly have anal tears, ruptures, and in some cases, their anus literally have drop out of their bodies and have to be uh, <clears throat> sewn back in. Ejaculation on the face, ATM, which stands for ass to mouth, where the penis is put into her anus and then her mouth without washing hair pulling, spitting in her face. You can have all of these going on. And also what we need to add is strangulation, which is different to gagging. Gagging is when they've got either the penis down her throat and she can't breathe or some object. Strangulation is with the hands around the throat. Now that we know increasingly this is referred to as rough sex and is being used as a defense in the court systems. For many reasons, we know, for example, that women who were battered if they are strangled during battery, they're more likely to end up either then or later dead. Also, the impact of strangulation can often take five to a week, days to a week to show because the airwaves start to swell up. So I want to give you an example of how they bring in young boys. So here's a site that was called Gag Me, Infant, Fuck Me, and it's now been the site since changed to um, Facial Abuse is the new name. And they say, do you know what they say to things like romance and foreplay? We say, fuck off. We take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would really like to do. We make them gag, blah, blah, blah. Now let's just say something here. This is how they get the young boy. We take gorgeous young bitches and do what every man would really like to do. That's not true. Every man doesn't really want to do this. But if you're 11 years old, and you have no, no repertoire or no sexual history or repertoire of, sexual, of being sexual with other people, which is very likely at 11, then who are you gonna believe? The porn industry seems very credible. It's cool to watch porn. And they're telling this boy, we know what you like before you even do. Another example is the promotional copy for anally ripped whores. We at Pure Filth know exactly what you want. Chicks being asked felt to let their sphincters are pink, puffy, and totally blown away. Adult diapers just might be in store for these whores when their work is done. And I want to be very clear here. I'm not picking the worst. When just going around Pornhub or other sites, these are the kinds of things you see. Now, again, look how clever this is. We at Felt Pure Filth know exactly what you want. No, you don't. The 12 year old boy who puts porn or butts or whatever into Google is not looking for this. He's looking maybe for a pair of breasts, maybe if he's lucky, a naked woman, if he's straight, but he's not looking for this level of violence. But again, they're saying to him, we know you, we know exactly who you are. And 
I want to make it very clear, we have over 40 years of peer-reviewed research. I've just put a few up, a few meta-analyses, some of which look at 10, 15, 20, 30 studies. The jury is back in with this, there is no question. And the weight of the evidence shows the harms that porn has, and the younger you get to porn, the more harms it has. So some of the selected effects over 40 years we found that the younger boys get to porn, the more limited capacity for intimacy, the more likely they are to use coercive tactics, including sexting, more likely to have increased engagement in risky sexual behaviors, harassment, rape, increased anxiety, depression, habitual addictive use, and erectile dysfunction. These are what the studies are now coming out with. And so when people argue there's no research, or maybe they cherry pick some study that is an outlier, that's like saying there's no such thing as global warming. Because when you're looking at social science or any science, again, you go with the weight of the research. Now, what's the future? The future, unfortunately, because the porn industry is running out of things to do, there's virtually nothing that has not been done to women in porn other than killer. So they're always, again, looking to what to do. And thanks to a Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition decision, what they did is they struck down two provisions of a 1996 act. And the big provision that was really important here is they said you cannot use women who look under 18. Well, that was struck out by the Ashcroft versus Free Speech Coalition decision. And literally overnight, you saw images like this explode all over the internet. It's my father, first time with daddy, daddy's whore. It's okay, she's my stepdaughter. So the question is, what are we going to do? We have left our kids a toxic culture. How are we going to do this? How are we going to change it? And this, and I understand we have a huge job on our hands. This is not going to happen overnight. And there's multiple ways that we have to attack this, much like the Gulliver strategy. You tie this porn monster down bit by bit by bit. But I want to introduce you to one strategy that we've developed at Culture Reframed. And we have argued that we need a collective impact, a public health approach, where we bring together educators, uh, mental health professionals, legal professionals, community leaders, parent groups, youth and family advocates, activists. We, the beauty of public health is it knocks down the silos because normally people are working with their own field, or within their own academic discipline. Public health is one of those places where silos are knocked down and it's a collective approach. We, a culture reframe, started by building a consultancy team which represents this um, across discipline, cross professional approach. And what we did is we looked at the literature in public health and we said, what are the key ways, the key protective factors for kids? And the number one was always parental support, well educated, informed parents. Quality healthcare is also very important and also educators. But we realized, you know, parents really need to know what's going on. They need to know what is porn, how do they talk to their kids about porn, when do they talk to their kids about porn, what do they say, and why do they have to say it? What are they going to do? Call a friend? But that's not even much help because really, again, what's she going to say or he going to say? And again, this is not parent blaming. I want to make it perfectly clear. This is not parent blaming because we understand that parents are so overwhelmed by what they have to do. So what we wanted to do was to create a one stop shop with the best complete with a complete best practice toolkit, which I want to make very clear is not is pro-sex we argue to be pro-sex means you have to fight pornography you cannot be pro-porn and pro-sex and we do not believe in shaming or blaming anybody around this what we are doing here is helping parents and caregivers and educators get knowledgeable about the impact of porn <coughs> and especially parents that so they can raise porn resilient kids so what we did is we developed programs online 
free programs for parents so that they can go on you can go to culturereframe.org and sign up they're again they're free we did this as a public good very importantly and to just give you an example of our parents of tweens we have 12 modules and um, you can go on for five minutes five hours five days we have embedded videos you can look at some of the videos with your kids. You can discuss some of these modules with your kids. These were built by a team of experts across disciplines. And then on the end, we say, how do we have porn talks with kids? And what we say is it's never one talk. And your kid, believe me, is not really going to want to be sitting across from you talking about porn. So we even discuss how you have these conversations with kids. For example, we say when you, especially with boys, the car is a great place because you're both looking straight ahead. You're not eye to eye. So we all out biking, ways in which you're not eye to eye. And then with these conversation scripts, you can go on any of these and we have mock conversations between parent and kid. And sometimes they don't go well. So we suggest ways in which you can bring them back. And you know what? They're probably not gonna go well in a lot of cases. That's okay. Go back and do a do-over, over and over again. And we suggest ways also in which you do not shame or blame your kid, ways in which you really see this as working with your kid who is being targeted by the porn industry. We also have a social media and mobile phone contract that you can work through with your kid, which gives plenty of opportunity to discuss how to keep your kids safe online. And remember, your kid will probably break the contract. That's part of the job description of being a kid. That's okay. Go back and do a redo. We have now just about to launch, it's up ready, our Parents of Teens program. So our previous one was for tweens, now it's teens. It's modeled after the tweens, only it's age appropriate, because we argue if you don't talk to your kids about porn, the porn industry will. So again, this is Culture Reframe, Solving the Public Health Crisis of the Digital Age. It's the Parents Program. And what I'd like to say is if you have any questions that I haven't answered, if you've got any feedback, on the presentation or you want to learn more about culture reframed and the porn crisis you can contact me at info at culture reframed there it's on info at culture reframed or through our website so um i'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news about what's going on in the life of our kids but you know what someday some kid is going to say to you where were you when all this was going on what did you do to deal with this? And you know what? I hope our answer is we did everything. We fought with everything we had. And if we use the word we, you know what? We can do something about this industry. We can make this a safe, healthy and vibrant culture for our youth because they deserve nothing less. Thank you. Okay, I'll... <laughs> Oh, I, I need a minute. I always need your phone with Gail. I, Gail, I, despite working to fight sexual exploitation for over a decade, every time I hear you speak, I, I like, I'm, I'm literally shaking and I, Sorry. but I can't thank you enough. I, I have four children under the age of nine and <coughs> I have three girls and when I was pregnant with our fourth, who happened, happened to be a boy, it was soon after I saw your presentation for the first time and I literally sat in my car and cried that I was having a boy and how am I going to raise him in this culture as well as my girls. Um, and I took a deep breath and remembered you are here helping us, that you have dedicated your life Thank you to my children, all children, and adults, quite frankly, um, in fighting this fight. And uh, you've helped immensely in navigating conversations with my children, with others. Um, I, I, my husband and I joke that we take our cues from the Amish in terms of our levels of screen time with our kids. But time and time again, I've found that 
you know, you don't know what other parents are doing. And now whenever we have play dates, I ask two questions. I, I moved to the South recently. I say, do you have a gun and is it locked? And do your children have access to screens? And it opens up a lot of conversations, um, but I hold that to be as dangerous as guns, the, the cell phones, the computers in the room. So, so thank you, Gail. Um, for the work that you do and for this incredible presentation. Thank you. Um, interestingly, my 12 year old son just walked right in the room. Um, and I am so immensely grateful, Gail. This was such a powerful presentation. It's so important for all of us as parents to be able to crack open these important conversations. So thank you. Um, I have a bunch of questions. Yes. The first is, what is the role? So, so it is abundantly clear that as parents, we need to be able to crack open these conversations. I'm a big believer in conversation in the car. I love it. Um, it's great. Although I, I should tell you honestly that um, when my son came down right before you talked and he was not paying attention to science, I said, you can either sit down and, and listen to an hour on pornography or you can go up and do your science. And he was like, I'm out of here. Oh, I'm out of here. Um, but what's the role of schools? Because for so many parents, um, you know, we've got a great turnout here, but there are a lot of parents that are not listening and are really fearful to have these really tough conversations, and they are tough. Are these appropriate conversations to have in schools? And if yes, how do we do them? Well, Absolutely. Where are schools is actually a great question. Schools are partying as if we live in the 1990s. There needs to be robust sex and relationship education. And part of that has to absolutely focus on the impact of porn on kids. Now, there are a few schools that have some really good sex ed programs that I've noticed, but I've not seen any schools where they really take pornography at the core. Because by the time the kid is 11, 12, they've come to school already shaped by the porn culture. So what I would argue is that first and foremost, it should be mandatory. And it's not just sex ed, it should be sex and relationship education like they're actually doing in England as well. And I would argue that they need to start having these conversations. They need to be bringing parents together. We know, for example, that in some schools, what they're doing is they're using our parents program. And instead of a book club, parents are going through our parents program together and using it so that they're forming communities in schools. We know that a lot of schools um, are using our parents program in human development classes and sex ed classes. I would say to parents out there that nothing strikes fear in a principal than a bunch of parents walking into the office saying we demand good sex education programs and we demand that you address the issues of porn that doesn't mean you show porn but we want you because we have to do this together you can't leave us alone to do this together they shouldn't be left alone to do this together so i think schools have dropped the ball and i wish that they would now realize what is going on and that all schools would have this as part of their curriculum and I'd add online safety. So my daughter was in third grade last year. She came, you know, we're playing ball in the backyard and she says, oh mom, a girl asked me to send a picture of my private to the computer. And I'm like, it literally took me 10 minutes to unravel. I'm like, you don't have access to, again, no computers, no smartphones. Turns out that the kids in third grade were using Google Docs and started using the comment function as a chat room. And so they're supposed to be doing homework. I mean, that, the poor teachers, I mean, they can't monitor every single student, right? But the kids are starting to, you know, to talk and then they can also go home and, can, and log into their Google account. So again, this isn't even, you can put every parental control in place, right? The, the, the predators are one step ahead, the porn industry is one step ahead and their kids are five steps ahead. So I did go to the principal and the teachers. And again, they're, they're overworked, under-resourced. I feel for them, but I was like, you, you, need to have online safety training for these kids before giving them these tools and, Absolutely. and then it became you know and then of course i had to help them create it but it is it's the parents the parents need to go the parents need to educate the teachers need to educate the parents um and again 
thank you for all the resources that you have provided. And there's a lot of resources on our website, culturelyfriend.org, where you can see about um, technology, et cetera. Great. Um, okay, so there's a question. How do, you suggest, how do you suggest speaking to men about the harmful effects of porn, um, especially men who see no problem with it? Um, well, there's actually some very good TED Talks out there by young men who talk about the impact of porn on them. There's one called Why I Stopped Using Porn, which is really useful. There's also <laughs> books out there. Um, Robert Jensen has a book about pornography and masculinity. Um, there's ways in which I would address this with men about the harms that it's causing them. But women do need to say, make it very clear when they're with men that they, they cannot have pornography in the relationship. Absolutely not. And I think women need to get you know, and it's not easy, I understand this, but there needs to be a very clear line drawn about this. And it's not going to be easy because you're going to come up with a lot of arguments. And also a lot, but then on the other hand, when I go to colleges, I come across a lot of young men who wish they'd never looked at porn, wish they'd never started. They can't believe, some of them, you know, say, I just can't leave my room, I'm using so much porn. Um, so they themselves don't want to be in this position in many cases. And they talk about how it ruins sex for them. They thought their first sexual experience was going to be like something out, you know, the choreographed porn. And it was like disappointing, miserable. Um, and also, you know, you should be the author of your own sexuality. You really don't want a bunch of creepy guys in California deciding what your sexual template should look like or the sexual template of boys and men across the world. Right. Gail, you, I've heard you often say, too, that pornography is the training ground for prostitution. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, first of all, the connections between pornography and prostitution are really important to point out, that a lot of women are prostituted into pornography, a lot of women in pornography are then prostituted out into brothels. Um, also, what um, we found is that um, men actually take their hardcore porn into the prostitute, into brothels. This is heard of this in all over from people who've done research. And they say, I want you to do this for me, do this. So there is a huge connection between it's the sex industry. And in fact, pornography and prostitution is a revolving door. Remember really pornography is prostitution with the camera going. We want to think of it as some kind of glamorous, you know, we say porn star. It's not porn star, it's porn performer. You've got maybe a handful of women who make money, real money, and who are well known. The rest are revolving in the sex industry. And many of them do end up, you know, it's a short hop from um, the valley in California to the brothels of Nevada. And so that's, I mean, we could go on and on about the connections. Melissa Farley does great work and I would recommend people look at her website. Great. Um, Here's another question. Um, the money made in the porn industry is such a hugely driving force to perpetuate all the ter terrible imagery. Aside from the changing messages we give and increasing awareness of the detriment of, that porn creates, how can we combat the financial gain that the porn industry is receiving and how that fuels with what they put out? Well, like you do with every other corporation, you have restrictions in place. I mean, porn is the only multi-billion dollar industry with absolutely no regulation. It is completely deregulated. So we need to, first of all, talk about age verification. Anyone can go on the porn sites. In, there has been um, a lot of discussion in Europe, uh, Europe about having age verification tokens or whatever. So different ways in which kids have to get age everyone has to get age verified by a third party before they can have access to porn sites and um what's interesting about the porn business model now is really mind geek has vacuumed up the money they have vacuumed it up from all the other small um, producers distributors and from the performers as well so i would say um mind geek is who we need to go after that's the big dog in town and that would really have an impact. Um, ha we have a question from an anonymous attendee. You spoke about a hypersexualized culture that defines gender expectations. 
Can you speak to that culture and its effect on the hypersexualization of young girls of color and how that has affected the way in which they are pigeonholed to those biases? The way in which what? Sorry, the last bit. Pigeonholed into those stereotypes. Absolutely. Well, and also there are different stereotypes for girls of color who are often more in pornography and mainstream culture, more hypersexualized, more pornified. I mean, what pornography does is it takes the, it takes the tropes of racism and it melds them to the tropes of sexism and it gives a double whammy to women of color. So I would say that women of color, girls of color are more at risk by this as well, more at risk by predators. We know that in terms of also of trafficking. So the more of color you are, the poorer you are, the more at risk you are by this whole industry. And the racism, by the way, in pornography. I mean, you if they had that level of racism in mainstream media it would be completely unacceptable yet pornography gets a pass like no other industry i'd encourage you we had um sharice hopkins from rights for girls speak a few weeks ago and it was about the effects of colonization and slavery on black women and girls and Native American women and girls in the United States and was drawing a lot of those links again with prostitution and racism certainly could be extended to pornography and this is something that we will continue through the series to examine is the racial dimensions of the sex industry and again, <coughs> disproportionately affects women and girls of color um, where the buyers are mostly white educated men. Absolutely. So, um, I want to just get to maybe two or three more questions. This is coming up a, a few different times in the in the questions. Um, are there are there feminist porn sites um, which are not violent and do not put forward unrealistic body types and focuses on intimacy rather than penetration? And and what are your thoughts about that? <laughs> well, this is an argument I hear a lot, and I often ask people, you know who do you mean? And they mention people like Erica Lust, um, et cetera. And I've gone on these porn sites and I've looked at them. And you know what? They might use different body types of women, but you're looking at a lot of the similar stories about women as sexually, um, sex objects for men, sexually disposable. And the bigger question is, you know, the first rule of feminism is do no harm to women. Do no harm. And what you are doing, whether you, whatever in pornography, is you are commodifying and you are monetizing women's bodies and you are saying it is okay to use women sexually for male sexual gratification because men are also looking at those sites. So I would argue also that these women, all women, have a right to sexual integrity and autonomy. And images in pornography destroy sexual integrity and autonomy of individual, any individual women. Why do you have the right to look at women at their most intimate and their most vulnerable when you don't even know who they are? Mm -hmm. um, last question, Gail, and then we're gonna wrap it up because we're out of time. This, um, this web series is for sure about education, but we also wanna make sure that we're inspiring action. What can people do right now when they get off this, this web series? Okay, so if you're a parent or if you're connected to kids and everyone on some level is connected to kids, I would say one thing to do is to tell somebody about Culture Reframe and to go onto the parents program, again, it's free, and that they should start having the conversations with kids so they have, we have poor, resilient and resistant kids and you can't do that alone. We have built a whole program to help you do that so spread the word tell other people because believe me parents and caregivers will be very grateful to know this help they don't know this help out there so i would say that is the one thing pick up the phone go on a zoom whatever but tell somebody about the free program out there that took you know 18 months to build two free programs that you can now use to have those conversations thank you gail and again this webinar will be posted on the world without exploitation website tomorrow so you can invite someone to watch this webinar direct them to culture reframed thank you from the bottom of my heart as a woman as a mother for this fight that you've been fighting for a very long time so thank you gail thank, I, thank you thank you
Thank Thank you for inviting me to this wonderful series. Of course. Um, So we invite everybody to join us next week. It's no coincidence that we are going to be talking about healthy masculinity um, after this uh, discussion about the toxic culture that our young men are growing up in. We will have two of my favorite men in the world, Jimmy Briggs, co-founder of Man Up, and Peter Qualiatine, who has worked with sex buyers for several decades and is now promoting the equality model around the United States. They will be talking about, their presentation is Man to Man, Promoting Healthy Masculinity and Ending Men's Violence. We challenge you to invite a male friend to listen in on this conversation. We're we're so happy that the series has just exploded. It is still largely women. We need to engage men in the conversation, in the fight. Men need to, need to be talking to other men about um, what being a healthy and uh, supportive man is in this fight against exploitation. So please join us next week. Again, if you can, please give to the Act Now Fund to support survivors during this quarantine COVID time when the most vulnerable among us are becoming even more so. Thank you everyone, hope to see you next week.